So the theme of this webinar today is contesting racism and anthropology, a controversial and much up-to-date theme nowadays. We will have several speakers from different countries and what I'll do is I will give the word to each one and I normally start on um, east to west um, direction just to make it easier. So we will have from South Africa, Joy Owen from the University of the Free State. From Poland, Mi Michal Bukowski from Adam Minkwinks University. Um, from Italy, Valeria Korozaks, University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. From Brazil, Lilia Schwartz, Schwartz from the University of Sao Paulo. And from the US, Irma McLaurin from the Irma McLaurin Solutions. Thank you very much once again to everyone. And I give the word to Joy. Hi, everybody. Uh, just to say thank you to Clara and the WCAA organizing committee for the invitation to this panel and, and conversation and discussion and debate. Um, I'm actually quite honored to be here. So um, I'm, I'm going to start in some ways with a reflection and I, I think I'm doing so because I want people to understand my particular positionality and as a result have a frame for the kinds of comments that I might make in the next hour or so. Okay. So I've been a student of anthropology since 1993. <laughs> it feels like forever at this point. Um, and since then, I've been an anthropologist. I've been a student. I've been a tutor. I've been a head of department. So I've been in various positions in at least three institutions in South Africa. And so what I'm going to say is a reflection in part, I think, in respect of the pedagogy, anthropological pedagogy, but also in terms of our research and also how we interact with each other as anthropologists as well. So I wanted to start with a, a very short story, um, very short, I uh, promise. Um, so in my first, first year of anthropological study, um, <laughs> I encountered what in South Africa people would say an Afrikaner man standing in front in the class saying that race is a social construct. Um, and as I said once before at the IUAS conference, that meant that my love affair with anthropology started, uh, but it also means that I've been trying to divorce the discipline ever since. And why would that be? Well, that opening statement made by Dr. Binzai at the time grasped me, because in 1993, we were shifting from um, an autocratic state, well, what I would think of as such, racist, etc., to a more democratic state. And we weren't quite there yet. This was 1993. And for someone who was externally identified as a person of color, um, colored, mixed, uh, depending on, on who you're talking to, the idea that race was a social construct in some ways, the way um, our students would talk about it now, actually blew my mind, right? Because in that moment, I actually had to engage with the idea that as a social construct, this thing, this word race, actually had a very real impact on myself as a young person at the age of 18, but also my lineage, my family, right, my matter line. Um, and so as the years have, have continued, um, I've had to come to terms with what it means to be externally identified as a woman of color, or a colored woman in South Africa, and still to uh, push a very humanistic idea of anthropology. And so trying to bring people across race, um, just focus on race for now, across race, to have conversations in the classroom setting, knowing that you know, we, we have people sitting with very diverse experiences as a result of their race and gender, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very difficult position to be in, because um, as we know, identity is constructed by self and the other. It's imposed by the other as well. And when you're trying to kind of walk uh, a line which is, responsive to in the classroom space, responsive to everybody sitting there, not just a particular kind of racial group or ethnic group. Um, it's hard. 
it's hard to do that work because fundamentally you are asking your students to have conversations not only about history, but the consequences of history, which is really their lived experiences and reality. So I'm going to leave it there for now. We'll now move on to Michal uh, Bukowski from Poland. Yeah, also thank you very much for invitation, which came to me as a sort of surprise because I do not consider myself a specialist on uh, race, the so-called race issues or racist, uh, racial studies. Uh, although, of course, I am interested in topics related to xenophobia and uh, things. So this is the connection probably. Well, in reference in you know, what I just heard from, from Joy, well, my personal experience with, uh, with, with the issue itself or with the people of different, different kind of skin color is totally different. I mean, I am from the country well, I, I, where the race was not discussed as an everyday topic and it was, I, I think that I've in my childhood, uh, I've never met a person, personally a person of a different color. Right? This was, uh, in that sense, if we may use these terms, still use these terms, or should we use these terms, it is, and, this, and it is still, still is a white society. But the uh, issue was, of course, important or pertinent to the uh, to the region for for um, historical reasons. I mean, historically, uh, Jewish population lived in the region, and uh, we all know the story about World War II and Nazi racism that also affected not only Jews but also other populations, including Poles. Uh, and this was a pure uh, racism that, uh, that that historically people. Uh, experience. But I would like to start actually from the topic, uh, from the first topic, let's say, whether there is a racist unconsciously held by some anthropologists. Well, I even be preparing for this meeting, I reached to some article that was published more than 10 years ago in current anthropology about the concept of race, whether anthropologists have a concept of race, whether they support the concept of race itself. Yeah? And the authors coming from the region, one from Croatia, I think, and two from Poland, they carried out a study about whether the race is a real scientific concept. And the majority of, uh, and there were, I mean, they did it, they compared, they compared it to other regions, and they also uh, did the study on Western and Eastern Europe. That was, that was the main topic. And, well, interestingly enough, there were some significant differences. So, according to this study, yeah, at that time, it was the first decade of, of, of this century, okay? Three quarter of mostly physical or biological anthropologists in the United States did not believe that the concept of race has any meaning. And only one fourth from Poland at that time, mostly biological anthropologists, didn't believe in the concept of race. So significant difference, yeah? And then the difference between Eastern and Western Europe was that two thirds of anthropologists, mostly biological anthropologists from Western Europe, did not believe in the notion of race. And uh, one third from Eastern Europe did not believe in it. Uh, in the concept of race. And, and I am talking about the concept of race itself, whether it, it has any meaning. And the authors then wrote that, well, it is itself for them inconsistent with biological knowledge. Yeah? But belief in race doesn't mean that people are racist. And this is uh, as the concept. Yeah? And this has to be definitely differentiated, I, I think. And uh, I only can deduce that. Well, there are some historical reasons for people to believe in the concept itself, and there are also some historical reasons for the understanding of the notion of race and racism and so on, which are somehow historically determined. And there is the question also of the semantics, 
what do you think by race, what do you think by races, what do you think also by racialization, yeah? So that the picture is really uh, uh, complicated. Uh, there are also generational differences that according also to this study, all the generation or, or at that time, all the generation anthropologists believed more in the concept of race than younger generation of, uh, uh, of anthropologists. And so uh, I would say that in the region itself, the number, let's say, of anthropologists who somehow still operate with the notion of race, race just deducting from this study, because I didn't carry any research on this, might be higher than or be more, still more entrenched somehow than in some other regions. Why? Because the issue itself is not discussed in terms as it is discussed in many other places where the issue of races is more pertinent or more visible and more discussed and is a, a larger social issue as it is, for instance, at the moment uh, in the United States because of black think, uh, 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 things matter. Yeah, so uh, uh, this is one, let's say, conclusion about anthropologists. The other conclusion that based on this deduction and on the context with Arno is that, well, I would say that the people who work in anthropology, ethnology in this society, well, they actually showed that while well, they are anti-discriminatory or definitely anti-discriminatory oriented. Yeah, and it was when, when the issue became uh, important and, and socially relevant and the, the, the discussion started, especially in 2015, around the um, anti-migration, uh, uh, let's say, uh, rhetoric. Uh, popular in, in political discourses, and then also Islamophobia. Then the, the society, the people, uh, the, 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 the whole milieu of anthropologists organized and organized a special uh, convention in which virtually all participated or uh, uh, gave support to it. Yeah? So uh, when we talk about anthropologists, I would say they are the issue, maybe it is, can be read somewhere in between lines because of history, because of education, but as, as, a, as a group, it is uh, definitely anti-discriminatory. And uh, I think I'm not you know, uh, praising my own colleagues and myself, but there is something to it, and especially in the context when the issue becomes somehow uh, discussed and uh, uh, pertinent to the, to the uh, social debates, public debates. Now we'll go to our next speaker. Uh, so please, uh, Valeria Korozaks from Italy. Great. So I want to, uh, to thank the organizers of this webinar, especially Clara. Uh, so I'm really glad to be here with you and to have this moment in which we can share our experiences and reflections about how to contest racism in anthropology, a topic I feel very urgent and important. So I will start remembering that Italy has a racist and colonial past and that we as a nation never believed it was relevant to recognize this past, recognize our responsibilities in murdering people and destroy territories in Africa. So I want to remember as well that uh, Italian racism affected and affect in different ways men and women of African colonies and African descendant. So it is fundamental to always consider, consider how racism and sexism are imbricated. Um, basically, uh, there was and there still is a conviction that with the end of the fascist regime, also the colonial and racist experience and discourse uh, were ended. Instead of uh, developing a public debate about our racist and colonial history, we decided to build our national identity on obscuring uh, or diminishing our colonial politics, 
reproducing the idea that we went to Africa to help poor people who were not civilized. One of the most crucial points of this manipulation of our memory and responsibility is the very spread idea that colonization was just, just related to the fascist period, which is not true. It began before. So uh, if we don't study and recognize this past, we will reproduce in a conscious or uh, unconscious way racism. So I will bear a um, Gloria Becker expression white innocence to describe as well Italian society. If we don't uh, assume as a collective mission, studying and recognizing our colonial and racist past and how it affects today our, our daily life, we cannot understand today racism. So anthropology, especially in the 30s, uh, was involved as well in the construction of the racist discourse about, about colonized people, and also about people living in the southern regions of Italy that were seen considered biological and cultural inferior. So there was also racism against Italians. Although since the 90s, we have some important studies about the anthropological production in the fascist years, um, several anthropologists have noted that we don't uh, used to devote much attention to the history uh, of the relationship between colonialism and anthropology. And I believe a special regard uh, uh, deserves the role uh, of whiteness, of Italian whiteness, uh, uh, what role it plays in anthropology. What it means the fact that most old teachers, I may be wrong, are white, and that they teach to mainly white students also if Italian society is not so white. How black Italians deal with the history of anthropology in general and uh, uh, Italian anthropology and the way uh, it is uh, taught in the university. It is important to discuss racism in our classes in relation to white privilege as well, to discuss how white privilege works in our discipline. This could help to think about the fact that the curricula we teach in our classes are mainly white and Western and male, of course, and that these choices are not neutral. We need to be more aware about these choices and maybe try to decolonize what we teach. I will end uh, just remembering an important debate uh, that took uh, place in Italy five years ago, more or less, among anthropologists concerning the term race in our constitution. So biological anthropologists uh, um, make a movement to ask to the government to remove the term race from the constitution, as France did, as you may remember, arguing that race doesn't exist as a scientific category. So we started a dialogue between biological and cultural anthropologists, and cult many cultural anthropologists express a similar position argument that as race doesn't exist in biological terms, its presence in the constitution would reproduce the idea that races as natural groups exist. Other anthropologists, including me, thought that today we do need this word race in the constitution to keep fighting against antisemitism and racism. So we have different positions in our community, about the use of race, but for sure I think that we must keep, we anthropologists, analyzing and describing racism that is the social relationship that produce race. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria. We will now have Lilia Schwartz uh, from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure and an honor. I, I, I want to start talking about giving, giving some backwards about Brazil. I think you know, but it's very important to start saying that Brazil was the, the country that, the re, that received the, the biggest population uh, coming from Africa. Brazil was the last country to abolish the slave system. Brazil had slaves everywhere in the whole country. And what, uh, and what happened in Brazil, in my opinion, we naturalized 
the slave, the slave system. We transform slave system in a kind of language. And anthropology had a special role in this sense. Uh, uh, a lot of, uh, it was Brazilian anthropology that, that introduced the racial Darwinism in Brazil, all theories that started uh, creating the idea that the world was, di was divided by races. It was a Brazilian anthropologist that created more than one, the, the theories of whitening, very, very influential in Brazil, even nowadays. And it was an, an anthropologist that created this myth of racial democracy in Brazil. Of course, it's a myth, and we are talking about anthropology. When Brazil celebrated 100 years of the end of the slave system, it's not very much an end. I have no time to talk about it, but maybe next, next, in the next, uh, my, my next speech. We organized at the University of Sao Paulo a research about uh, racial, how, how person would think about prejudice. The first question was, the, the research was organized in, in 1988. Uh, the first question was, do you have prejudice? And 96% of the answers were no. Second question, uh, do you know a person that has prejudice? 99% of the answers, yes. And then the third question, if you said yes, try to describe the relationship you have with this person. We didn't ask for names, but people wanted to give names. Like, names and uh, like relationship. Uh, they used to say, my mother, my father, my boyfriend. So the informal conclusion of the research was that every Brazilian thinks he or she is uh, an island of racial dem democracy surrounded by racists everywhere. Situation is changing in Brazil now. Uh, I must say that we have a very, very important black uh, movement and an activism in Brazil. It did not start now, in this year. It started in the beginning of the Republic, uh, at the end of the slave system. But the problem in Brazil is that media system and even this whitening and this very white society that wants to, to keep black people invisible, it's very strong even nowadays. We live in Brazil, we have in Brazil, uh, the, uh, a kind of racism that can be considered a systemic racism, a structural racism, and an institutional racism. Uh, it's to say that in Brazil, the most important positions, the most important uh, uh, kind of jobs are all, um, all with, with, uh, filled with white people. But and that, and that thing is very, I think it's very, it's not particular, but it's very much Brazil. The idea of transforming the other in an invisible person, a person that you don't see, a problem you cannot see. Uh, and of course, this kind of prejudice, this kind of very perverse prejudice are part of our institutions. And they are, this is part of the, our uh, departments of anthropology. Uh, if you think about, about our departments, as Valeria said, uh, they are most, professors are mostly white. If you think about our curricula, we, we ask students to read mostly white uh, thinkers, white and male thinkers, no? We have no women and it's starting to have women, but not, we do not have a lot of uh, black uh, thinkers of Brazil in our formal curricula. Uh, if you think about students, that's in Brazil nowadays, it's important to say that formal uh, research, just state research, just informed that 56% of the population of Brazil is black or pardo. Even so, uh, we do not see these people in our universities. At the university where I teach in Brazil, that is the University of Sao Paulo, uh, we have now a quota system for the, the, the graduate students, and we are trying to change the configure, internal configuration of, the, of, my uni, of my school, not of, of my university. 
54% of the students now are black or pardo. If I have time, I will explain about pardo, not now. But what I want to say, that Brazil is a kind of paradox. It's a country that likes to depict itself as a country of the uh, of democracy, racial democracy, of like a country of of very no wars, no problems, no violence. But it's a very violent country, and but it's a country that has this kind of me cultural myopia. No, so. Uh, now it's very difficult to say, okay, we have no race, because we know that we have social races. So in our next term, I would like very much to talk about social race in Brazil and listening to you. It's really a pleasure for me. Thank you so much. Uh, now, last but not least, uh, Irma McLaurin from the US. So you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, global, good morning to everyone. I'm happy to be here. And I'm gonna start with a couple of provocative statements. One, I wake up black every day. And by that, I am talking about this category of race. It's not as a biological concept, but as, as a social category. I also wanna say that despite the fact that there may not be black people in certain countries, that anti-blackness is global. And finally, that I want to say is that empathy as a discipline has actually been complicit in perpetuating the idea of race as a social concept, but also weaving it into the way in which we think about biology, weaving it into the way in which we uh, education and how it has constructed its history. And so one is that despite its commitment you know, to this idea of cultural relativism, anthropology itself has actually functioned as white public space, something that Karen Brotkin talks about, and Janice Hutchinson and Audrey Smedley, uh, that black anthropologists, and I'm talking about in America, are the largest subgroup in the discipline, and yet we are grossly underrepresented in hiring um, in graduate students. And when we are in those spaces, and I've spent some time over the last few years serving as an advocate and consultant to Black and other faculty of color in anthropology departments who feel as if they're under assault. And so if you look at the fact that we are graduating and producing more Black American PhDs in the discipline, and then you look at the fact that despite that uh, increase, in the education of Blacks in the field of anthropology, if you look at the hiring practices, we are grossly underrepresented. And in fact, often find that the only place that we can find support for our ideas about racialization, about social race, about the impact of structural racism you know, on people is in departments of Afro-American studies, women's studies, cultural studies, anywhere but anthropology. The way in which we have written the history of anthropology has been about the white male lens, the perspective. Uh, it has been about assuming that the white cultural perspective that is rooted in Europe is the dominant perspective and that it is the correct perspective. And so those things have informed the ways in which we teach our classes, the ways in which we structure uh, our methodologies, uh, the ways in which we interpret the data that comes before us. And so I just wanna say that um, the idea of race is something that anthropology has grappled with. I think our public education project, uh, Race Are We So Different, certainly gave us a platform that has reached over, I think something, uh, several million people in the time that it, it's circulated across the United States, it has had a tremendous impact on how to uh, deconstruct the social category of race. And yet we still talk about it as if it were a biological category. So I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done.
So thank you very, very much, Irma. We've now finished our first round. Everybody has been really um, attentive and has talked just the right time. Uh, we will now move on to a second, um, a second turn. So I'll start with uh, Joy once again from South Africa. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your interventions. Um, <laughs> my mind is going in all kinds of directions. And I think what I'm going to do is, is, is try and bring it um, home specifically to what you see in front of you. So, so my body and my experiences over the past while. And I think in some ways this will get us to think about the ways in which we as anthropologists also perpetuate not only racial thinking, but racialization in our classroom spaces and possibly even during and in research. Um, so something, something that seems pretty simple, which uh, I don't think actually is, right? So in anthropology, the idea is that if you're going to make a name for yourself in the discipline, you actually have to study uh, the other, however that other is defined, yeah? So I find it interesting, or I found it interesting when I was working in one institution, when we had presentations from uh, what we refer to as our honors students, but these would be fourth year students, and they were doing presentations of the potential research proposals. So potential research sites, research question, et cetera. I found it intriguing when the white students were, and I'm going to be blunt, so when the white students were encouraged to actually go and study the other, so linguistically, uh, socioculturally, um, gender, et cetera, et cetera. They, white students were encouraged to go and study the other. Our black students were encouraged to study themselves, to, in essence, uh, go native, and nobody sitting around the table took issue with this. And uh, when I raised it, it was said, uh, you know, students have a short period of time in which to do the research. Uh, if they're working with people amongst themselves, uh, it's, it's easier. You know, they, they've, they've got the, the lingo, the language, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody questioned, but hang on, you have encouraged white students to go and study the other. Let's just start there, right? So that, that's one thing. Um, then we as teachers, and, and so what am I trying to do? In, in many ways we've, you know, the, the previous speakers have looked at the history, there's a particular kind of history in South Africa as well in terms of anthropology and the creation of the apartheid state and the idea that there were two anthropologies in South Africa and one aspect um, was particularly involved in the creation of the apartheid state. But I don't want to look at the history, I want to look at what we are currently doing, right? So something as simple um, as someone saying, you know, uh, hi comrades, how are you? Um, hi my friends, how are you? We, we shouldn't think that there's any concern with that, but it is when it's said by a particular kind of body. I'm, I'm kind of uh, taking the person away from this, but if it's said by a particular kind of body, to a particular group of students, it can be very problematic. It's not friendly. It's not encouraging closeness. It's not encouraging honesty. If anything, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a denigration in some ways. It's a, it's a humiliation. And some people won't necessarily see that. They won't recognize that if a white person, a white anthropologist, a white anthropologist, teacher, pedagogue, says to black students, a predominantly black class, my friends, that this is problematic. Okay. So those are, those are two instances where I think we need to be clear in terms of what we are thinking when we say things, when we do things, and what the unintended consequences of those words um, expressions, interactions, what those un unintended consequences are. And if we are not pushing for us, all of us, no matter race, class, gender, ethnicity, where we are in the world, if we are not pushing for a particular level of reflection and reflexivity with those who are perpetuating the discipline, we are actually going to continue 
um, racialized thinking and racialization. And we're going to get to a point where our students have to become radical and also probably our research participants in order to actually get us to wake up to the fact that we are perpetuating racist thinking. What I probably will move to is that, well, I asked, I talked about anthropologists, whether they are, whether do they share a concept of race and, and races, and I said, well, some of them, they still think that race as such as a category is a valid category, but they definitely, most of them are definitely, all, probably all of them are against races. Yeah, that they are all, well, we can talk about different people, but we are all humans. That's, that's I would say, that's the this common story. But then the other question is, and Maxi rose it also, uh, in the chart, yeah, it's uh, the question of social category. How does it exist? And when anthropologists protested against xenophobia and racism at this exceptional convention held in 2007, uh, 16, but not only that, yeah, you uh, know, they do did it because the racism and the category of race is there common in the society and uh, well the society itself is a part of the europe of europe and uh, northern hemisphere uh, ethnocentric europe and also uh, in terms of intellectual history yeah in the past there were people who studied race and it, as it was studied in the 1920s and 30s and and before in in scientific terms yeah but then this historical experience somehow should help them to to deny it but this was not the case and the paradox is that the society itself somehow experienced historically experienced this racism which i've mentioned before but it it is held among the people but there are yeah why it is it is it so i think because of the education and the school curricula elementary school and secondary school curricula in which you can find books about Africa uh, and uh, in which you know black people in Africa are, or Muslim in Africa are presented as as in a way which we do not accept at all yeah so it is somehow reproduced at this rudimentary um, level and I am trying to answer Marx's uh, uh, question and then yeah, you, so there are, well, then this kind of should be, uh, races should be distinguished from the races which was experienced here, which I also mentioned, which is anti-Semitism and anti-Gypsies. These were, are minorities which were present here. And it, it, of course it is a racist, but it's a different races that uh, most of you talk about. Uh, at the moment, not all of you, but most of you talk about it, yeah? And even if you deny and condemn it, and this officially it is denied and condemned, it is somehow still uh, popular. And then there is a question of cultural racism or even yeah. cultural apartheid, which is uh, fundamentalism, which become so important uh, in uh, in the recent uh, uh, refugee uh, crisis, and it still goes on. It is not a racism in a let's say a sensu stricto or however we call it, but it's combined with nationalism, with uh, Islamophobia, and it is. I mean, th there was a wave of rage against other, and it was politicized and used in political uh, political uh, discourse. Uh, and uh, this discourse has contributed to the, uh, to the to the to the phenomenon that well people talked about being uh, expressing their Islamophobia openly and they were proud of it. Yeah, in terms usually in terms of cultural uh, uh, racism, and uh, so the, the the issue is really complex. There is one thing which is the I would say the 19th century uh, and Eurocentric places, and there is an internal European places, and now they are combined together and they fund 
uh, somehow expression or articulation in this cultural races combined with nationalists and 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 um, uh, the Christianism, however you call it, uh, or anti-Muslim uh, anti-Muslim uh, feelings or practices, de facto. So I will now focus on Black Italians. Uh, I will start saying that in Italy we don't have a law that recognizes Italian nationality to children born in Italy from parents that are not Italians uh, or grew up in Italy. So this situation clearly shows how deep it is racism in our society, especially, especially at the institutional level, and how whiteness is seen as an essential trait for um, of Ita Italianity, if we may say. So we deny the fact that black Italian exist. Um, uh, when George Floyd was murdered in Italy, um, as well in other countries, we had strong reactions, denouncing uh, racism and supporting Black Lives Matter movement. It was very important to have this debate uh, on the racist brutality of the police and on how racism is institutionalized. However, some Black Italians wrote articles noticing that in Italy we don't used to have the same strong reactions when black people are killed because black or about racial profiling or when African people die, uh, dies because um, of their living and uh, working condition, condition especially in the agriculture, um, which are extremely inhuman, as you may know. These articles and debates showed how racism works in our society. So we deny it, we can recognize it in another country as United States, but we deny it when it happens in Italy. And this debate exposed also the question of which is the role of white people? Uh, how can white people uh, can support uh, anti-racist and black actions and battles? So one of the most important points in, in this debate raised by black Italians, especially it was um, black, uh, black women, was about how black people are represented in the media. So uh, generally they are victims, uh, passive people, uh, individuals who need Italian, that is white help or support, or otherwise they are seen and represented as dangerous people for the Italian community. So at this point, is, I think it's very relevant, re, re, relevant if we think how uh, the anthropological case histor historically constructed the object of its studies as the other. This is something that Joy already mentioned it in, her, um, in her speech. So this other it was basically African, Black, uncivilized, pre-modern, tribal. So uh, I think it is important to ask what can an anthropologist do for not reproducing a similar case today? Can we do more or better? And of course, we are doing a lot. We are committed, but it is important also to ask ourselves, can we do better? So one possible path white academics can take, I believe, is also listening to what black Italians say and ask. And from this point of view, the Brazil situation, which Lilia already mentioned, the Brazilian experience is of great interest. Of course, we know there are huge differences between Brazil and Italy, but the role of the black movement in Brazil is really important um, to, to study and, and to analyze especially concerning the university and the um, affirmative actions, the quota in the public universities. So I want to bring here an example concerning a recent action, well, not really, really recent, one year ago, against a statue of a famous journalist, Indra Montanelli, 
oh, oh, he died uh, in 2001, um, who recounted many occasions how he both, a girl, uh, 14 or 12 years old, when he was a soldier in Ethiopia during the Second World War. He used to say uh, that he was no more uh, to act in this way in Ethiopia, that it was normal to have what he called and he considered sexual intercourse with young girls. So last year, uh, uh, the feminist movement, Non Una Di Meno, threw pink uh, paint into the Montanelli statue in the city of Milano as a form of den denouncing our racist and colonial past and how it is represented today by the institutions. Montanelli is a celebrated in the public space of Milan and in this way it is as well celebrated the sexist and the racist violence he represents without considering how African descendant women could feel and can feel today in seeing this statue in the public space. So the non una di meno action was heavily criticized from right-wing and left-wing parties. Uh, it opened a space for a public discussion about how racism and sexism intersect, intersected in our colonial history and how urgent it is to discuss the way we treat this history and also the way we uh, talk about this history in our classes. It's opening a space to discuss who is legitimized to contest racist and sexist actions and the way they are represented in public space and public um, memories. Uh, I have a picture, maybe I can try to share, just you can have it here. Uh, yeah, you can do share screen. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, did it work? Can you see the picture? Okay, so this is one of the picture and um, thank you and later maybe we can keep talking about these questions. So after Valeria we'll have Lilia uh, Schwartz from Sao Paulo again. Uh, my opinion maybe we anthropologists would think that we are doing lots of things but it's not in my opinion, it's certainly not enough. Um, I live in a country now that I, I'm, I do know that it's not just in Brazil, but Brazilians just elected, not just an, a year ago, elected a very conservative president, a very conservative president that has a, ve a completely different agenda. He is a populist um, president, a technocratic president, and as a populist the president, he is very much against journalism, democratical institutions, and science, and academia. And he is really is acting against minorities in Brazil, minorities that I might, must say, they are not minorities. They are minorities in representation because they are majorities, you no? Know? But uh, Jair Bolsonaro is the name of our president. He is a person that, that works in denial. He denies the killing of the native people in Amazon and in the center of the country. He denies the genocide of black young uh, people that are, we, are, we have numbers of a civil war as Syria or Afghanistan and he is in completely denial. He denies Brazil has problems with uh, feminists, with, with women, that this is a very violent country against women. He denies completely LGBTQ population in Brazil. He says it's a kind of perversion. He denies Candomblé, that I think you know, it's a, a Brazilian, not an African Brazilian religion. And he denies completely, he, there is a, a really a problem in, in black uh, people that in black religions in, in the country and uh, Jair Bolsonaro is promoting a kind of uh, dual killing. He's, uh, he agrees about the killing of people, of black people mainly, and the killing of memories. 
We have in Brazil a, 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 an institution called Fundação Palmares that is completely devoted to, to bring back the memories of the black population. And now he, we have a president of this institution, it's a black president, but he says everything is bullshit. It never, it's not, it's not true. And he's really trying to, to put an end in this kind of story. Brazilian has not just a white anthropology, but I'm also an historian. We have a very white history in Brazil, a white history meaning a very European history, a very uh, male history, uh, a kind of, we try to not to talk about uh, native people and the, the whole of native people in our history, or even black people and the whole of, and we have a kind of blindness, blindness in the country. Uh, we, we do know that all the heroes can be, are, they are created you know, by history, and we know how history has his, this very perverse whole of denying uh, a country like Brazil that has this kind of problem of imagination. There is a, a, a very traditional politician from the beginning of the 20th century, Joaquim Nabucco, that used it to say that in Brazil, reality is one thing, but imagination, our imagine, not our, white Brazilian imagination are totally focused in Europe and now in the United States. Brazil does, does not have a strong relationship with Latin America. That's very important. We do, not, we do not talk about our neighbors. So it's a kind of cultural and social amnesia. And I think that in Brazil, we are, going to, we are passing through and we are going to pass to a very, very difficult moment, having this very conservative uh, government. Lilia, thank you for bringing in uh, the role of presidents <laughs> in this whole uh, discussion and also the, the whole question of, of memory and sort of changing history. Uh, we are now faced with, at this very moment, a president who has declared uh, having anti-racism training in the federal government is un-American. We have Black Lives Matter protesters being called domestic terrorists. And so the question is, which side will anthropology come out on? In other words, will anthropology take up an amicus brief and write a letter to the president protesting in the same way that we protest the defunding of the National Science Foundation or critiques to uh, the way in which science is, is analyzed? Is there going to be that political posture in which we say absolutely unacceptable? that engaging in discussions about anti-racism is just as important as discuss, you know, engaging in discussions about climate change. So I think that's one thing that we need to sort of be clear about and what we're trying to do. The second is that we already have evidence in which in the state of Texas, they made it illegal to teach a Latin you know, uh, history. Um, so we're at a moment where we're also asking the question, what will anthropology be teaching? Okay, is it going to be a holistic history of the field of anthropology? And again, I'm talking about American anthropology, which was the creator of the four field discipline. That started in American anthropology at Columbia University, and it was based on the study of Native Americans. And I have the evidence that when someone like Zora Neale Hurston wanted to sort of do a, a four-field study and sort of do a holistic study of Negroes, uh, she did not get the support that she needed. She was told you have to follow the path that's already been set, right? Uh, and basically was, was um, you know, was actually dismissed. Well, she wasn't dismissed, she walked away. But the financial support she needed to finish her PhD in anthropology was never given. And while anthropology has valorized and, and, and lifted up the work of amateur archaeologists and amateur anthropologists who are white, they've never given black anthropologists who did the work either formally or informally 
the credit that they need. And in many respects, that lack of support continues. I cannot tell you how many Black students I've met at different conferences who come up to me and say, Black feminist anthropology saved my life. And someone asked the question about using sort of these centralist categories. I think we have to get out of our head that the theories we create are just that. They're theories, the explanatory tools. People live their lives, okay, in certain kinds of ways. And we can't confuse our analysis of it with the lived reality. And the lived reality of Black undergraduate students and graduate students in anthropology and Black faculty is that they often feel assaulted. They feel as if they're derided for studying the concept of race and the impact of racialization on people's everyday lives. They have been um, basically persecuted for supporting Black Lives Matter. And I can tell you of a case in which a faculty, a Black faculty, the only one in the department, was actually taken up on charges for asking her colleagues to support Black Lives Matter. Today, everybody is doing it. But two years ago, she was actually brought up on charges of violence by a white colleague. And then she, was, she had to get an attorney to be able to defend herself. At the end, they decided she was within her free speech, you know, if she can have it, but there was no apology and the damage had been done. The time she lost trying to protect herself with no support from her colleagues uh, in that. And so these experiences, and I want to say, this is not just a white male uh, project, enterprise. White women have also been complicit in the erasure of black women's anthropology. We've not been, if you look at the corpus of what's being taught as feminist anthropology, there are very few black women, if any, who are included in the canon. So they're not teaching us either. We're not cited. And so there's a whole project called, you know, hashtag site black women that has taken up this enterprise of making us more visible. And I have taken it, you know, undertaken the task of creating the black feminist archive. Because for me, if we don't preserve that, that knowledge, whether people are famous or not, uh, then it's going, it's going to get lost. And so memory, knowledge, preservation of that is very important, but also the support of the kind of research that, that Black students and Black faculty want to do is critical to anthropology. We have tons of comments and questions on the chat. Some have been answered by, you know, dialogue in the chat. Others not. Uh, from what I've read, and I'm not sure I read everything, but there's, of course, several questions dealing with something that Irma and Lilia and basically all the speakers have mentioned, which is the problem of racism, uh, of course, in the U.S. universities, but not only in the U.S. and overall in the global north, uh, where elites are admitted to um, grad programs and where they are, the black, the black people are not hired by um, Ivy League universities, etc. So that's a, a problem that has been um, discussed already. Uh, at least partially. And then, of course, there are several questions concerning um, the essentialism, the dilemma of using the very categories you seek to disconstruct to analyze them. So the, 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 the way and the concepts we use when we are uh, not only analyzing racism, but passing it on to our students. And of course, now Irma, the, the last speaker, made a very wonderful connection um, of, of this uh, essentialism and essential concepts and theoretical concepts to what we have nowadays unfortunately in 2020 and in this world where we live a pandemia and we are living also with um, politicians like Bolsonaro or Trump and the fact that anthropology needs to be more in the real action. I think, I don't know if I got Irma right, but I think I did and I agree with her and probably a lot of people here too that we need to be more, we need more action from anthropology. We cannot just stay in the concepts, in the essential concepts, um, theoretically, but we need to go to the field and, and, and to do real action. So I don't know, perhaps these are just two topics that I'm throwing in from what I read in the chat. So who wants to? I just want to say that I think now is the moment for anthropology to revisit the enterprise of cultural critique. We now need to turn the lens back on ourselves in the same way we did about 
you know, when we were looking at the enterprise of ethnography, right, we now need to turn that lens back on ourselves in terms of looking at uh, how anti -race, how racism and the need for an anti-racist perspective has informed our graduate programs, who gets in, who finishes, who gets hired, who gets tenure, who gets promoted to full professor. You know, these are the things. Uh, and we need to sort of make a stance about it. We also need to be very careful about the way in which we use this concept of people of color as an all-encompassing con you know, um, concept. There is a difference between the experiences of anti-blackness and people of color. They are not the same. And what we often are doing is that, for example, we started with a minority, uh, and now it's sort of a people of color fellowship. And so what happens is that the experience, the historical underrepresentation of black people, people of African descent, in the Americas gets lost as we start trying to sort of include everybody's experience. And so I think we have to sort of also deconstruct that and sort of parse them out so that we're being very clear about what are the issues that we're currently dealing with and not trying to lump them into one thing. At this point for me, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the ways in which we ignore the fact that we actually need more um, I'm going to say it, people of color <laughs> um, in, our, in our departments, um, particularly in South Africa. And we're not necessarily thinking about the ways in which we make that as anthropologists um, in the academy, how we actually make that almost or near impossible. So I'm, I'm, I'm an example person. So let me give you an example again here. If, if for example, um, you make a bold statement in, in your department and you say, actually, you know what? The um, racial demography of this department is not representative of the entire population. So for example, if we have uh, a surplus of white academics in the anthropology department, that is not um, representative of the external demography, right? Which is literally black African. Uh, so what are we actually going to do about that? And when you have a colleague respond and say to you, uh, we should talk about diversity. Uh, how, are you, how are you meant to engage that? Especially when that is followed up by, uh, diversity is not only about racial diversity. What is the intention of that comment? It's, it's, to me, you know, we, we are talking about the, the external spaces. We are talking about what's happening outside there. But this is actually happening within our departments. So in some way, I'm going to respond to a comment Muggsy made there. Um, we said, to what extent is the problem you raise about my friends a product of the age of the lecturers concerned? You know, Muggsy, I'm going to be bold enough to actually say that for uh, people of color, people who would self-define as black, um, people who are black, black African, however it is we're going to position them for, and I'm going to say us for the first time, for us, it, we, we can't deny that we have to do this work. So consistently we will find a reason to say, okay, that wasn't actually a racist comment um, or the, the intention behind that comment is not meant uh, negatively or to humiliate. There's a lot of work that black people have to do in the interaction with white people. And, and here we can talk about privilege. So for many white people, they can actually leave that interaction at the door and they don't have to think about it beyond that space. They're not encouraged to think deeper about what it actually means to say something like that as a white person to young black people. So for me, and, and I've been talking to a number of my colleagues over, over the years, trying to make sense of you know, what, what has also become uh, referred to as microaggressions. What, what exactly is that? Where, where does it sit in the interaction? And for me, it's important for us to recognize that when someone comes and says, you know, as, as a black person, I've just felt um, humiliated, discarded, ignored, um, unacknowledged, we actually have to sit, no matter, no matter our racial uh, phenotype, we actually have to sit with that 
and wonder how we are actually um, perpetuating those kinds of interactions. Because if somebody in our discipline can say, um, why is it that you know, black and colored anthropologists in South Africa are open to being reflective and reflexive, and they will talk about their position, but white anthropologists are not, why is that not taken up as something that has to be discussed in the discipline, for example, in South Africa? So to me, you know, this conversation raises um, a, number of, a number of interesting points, um, but also a need to recognize that what we are talking about, again, and this goes back to what Irma said, what we are talking about and what we are trying to theorize is actually lived experiences, not for those outside them, not for the other, not for those that we are studying, but for those who are actually in our departments, who, who embody pedagogues, who embody students, who embody PhD students, etc. So this is not something that is external um, and that can be theorized to a point where, you know, we want to say that uh, Actually, we're done with race, we're beyond race. So, yeah. Quick uh, answer. I saw that, um, I think maybe somebody from Italy asked if uh, the problem about denying racism in Italy could be that racism is associated uh, with immigration. And uh, what I wanted to say by remembering our colonial past and uh, is exactly that I we cannot link racism just with the fact that some people arrived in Italy and there was a sort of hostile reaction. Uh, we have all, we already had a, a, a discourse and a, a, a practice of destroying uh, this uh, population in different parts of Africa. So we have uh, we cannot understand today racism without studying and knowing our precedent history. So I think that in Europe, uh, in um, countries as Italy, we have this uh, easy way of thinking about racism, like a sort of a, a territory or geographic problem. Oh, they came here. First of all, we should ask why some people coming from countries that were colonized by us come here. But as, we, are, we were not neutral. Our minds were already ready to uh, think some specific, in some specific way, which is racist and sexist. So um, that's why I think that we have to talk about racism in Italy without linking always to migration. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I uh, try to answer, I get to... to um answer this question I, I agree completely that we it's time to think of what kind of anthropology uh, we want to teach in this world we live you know, uh in a, this very conservative world uh this experience pandemia now uh in this world that some values are turned are complete pass, passing through a kind of uh, and they are changing completely. In my opinion, it's very difficult to give. I, I, I won't say, oh, go this way or go that way. But I think anthropologists, we have to go public in this moment. We have to have a public voice in order to create a dialogue. I also agree that we have to change. We have to think about the concepts we use. No, uh, we, have, we have to think about, uh, there is one question, most academics in Brazil are white. Yes, most academics are white. And how are we going to change this picture? Uh, uh, sorry to give always examples coming from Brazil, but I think this is my whole, whole here. For example, President Bolsonaro is financing a group of historians located in the south of the country, and they are creating uh, uh, videos for the YouTube and things like this, saying, for example, that slave system was not so strong in Brazil, and that, slave, that slaves were slaves in Africa, this kind of thing. They are saying things like this, oh, we did not have a, 
a dictatorship, a military dictatorship. We had a, a kind of very democratic uh, coup d'etat. So that, that, that kind of thing. Our former president, education minister, he finished his work uh, talking and acting against quota system. And in 2022 in Brazil, we are going to, uh, to discuss again about in, the public, in a public debate about quota system. So uh, I think that we anthropologists, we are, uh, you can talk about if this is consciously or unconsciously, but in my opinion, I agree completely with the other panelists that we are perpetuating racism and also perpetuating sexism and xenophobia and misogyny. I think it's time to act. No, anti-racism is based on acts. And I'm white, so I'm not the, a protagonist, but I, I feel myself as an ally. And the way of dealing with this is talking about race, showing how race was created by white civilization. <laughs> white civilization created slave system, created racial Darwinist the theories. So I think we have to move on and I think we have to go public. It's time to be in the media. It's time to talk it, but otherwise we are going to, to stay backwards and we are not going to, to have more in my country. We are not going to, in this, in this sense, we are not going to change the face of the university. We are not going to change our students. I think it's time to move on. <laughs> Thank you know everyone for their their insights because I think only if we talk about it. So one of the things that I've been doing as a consultant is actually serving as an advocate and a coach for black people and other faculty of color who are in anthropology departments and feel like they're under assault. And one of the things that I find is this kind of I would call it I you know in my public writing I call it white magical thinking which is that white people believe that because intellectually they can understand these things, then it doesn't translate into a behavior or set of practices and policies that in many respects end up excluding as opposed to being inclusive. And I'll give you a concrete example from my own life history. In 1999, I became the first black person ever and person of color tenured through the ranks at the University of Florida. The first in 1999, ever, okay? The department was ranked 11th in the nation. You know, it is the place where, you know, Russ Bernard is there and Marvin Harris was there. I mean, I had all the greats. I was the first in 1999. And things that happened before I came up is that there was another person who had been there before me. I was coming up early. And the first thing that someone asked me is, do you think there's a problem with you coming up at the same time as this black per person? And I'm saying, are you saying to me that you cannot possibly in your mind conceive of having to vote for two black people at the same time? And yet in the course of other people coming up, there have always been multiple white people coming up. But somehow the idea that they would have to, to vote on two black people simultaneously, and I was literally asked to step back, to wait, so they didn't have to have that struggle. And yet no one finds it problem to have multiple white people come up for tenure at the same time and it goes. So somehow there's a disconnect between the intellectual material that we read and that we understand and we consider ourselves to be know about and then the actual practice of what we do. Most anthropology departments, people stay in the chairs for 12 to 13 years and if it's a man and usually it's Brown, so that the idea that someone not white could come up and sort of achieve that rank is highly impossible. Historically, most full professors have been white men and all cadre of white women. But at Florida, they actually had an award in which they had to change it because it stipulated that the person to receive it had to at least been a full professor for something like 15 years. They could not find one woman in the entire University of Florida who fit that criteria, not one, because the numbers in that full professor rank were so small 
So they had to go back and redo it. I'm sure if they then had to look at black women with PhDs or black faculty, they would find the numbers are so small. And just to close, when I left the University of Florida in 2004, I was one of three black associate professors in the entire College of Arts and Sciences, three in 2004, and there were only three black full professors in the entire College of Arts and Sciences. So the numbers in general are very small, and unless we are aggressive and look at our policies and practices, why are people not getting tenure? No one should come up for tenure who's not prepared. So what have we done to do that? The same with black graduate students finishing their degree. I believe that if a student gets to their comprehensive exams or their defense and they're not ready, then we have failed them. They've not failed, we failed them. And what I'm seeing is that the discipline is failing black graduate anthropologists. They're either not finishing or they're going to other disciplines because they feel unwelcome, or if they're junior faculty, they are moving their lines to other departments because they feel like they are not supported and that they're literally under assault. I agree completely with, with Irma. We, we failed. We failed completely, and we failed in, in perpetuating this kind of uh, academic stru structure that never changed. Uh, the idea that we have universal criteria are completely failed. How can you say that we have in Brazil universal uh, rules or criteria if we have people that have completely different backgrounds? No, I think I I I don't have I I think we really have to open it now to try to shake universe try to shake our departments otherwise this, we are going to study ra racial questions but we are not going to introduce this kind of racial questions issues in our lives and that makes a big difference no well, otherwise we are going to stay like this talking about us talking about our problems talking about our questions but not but failing, as Irma said, not, we are not close to people. Well, I decided, for example, to work in, in, a, in a museum. The, uh, it's MASP, it's a big museum located in the heart of Sao Paulo. And I, I was part of, a, I was a curator of an exhibition called uh, uh, Afro-Atlantic Histories. It was the first time that we brought uh, paintings coming from Cuba, from Jamaica, even bringing uh, black painters, black artists. For me, it was like paradise because we had numbers of people coming. We had lots of, of discussions, people that like, people that do not like. That this, for me, it's not a problem. The problem is how we are going to talk with people and how we are going to to uh, to uh, uh, to have black people, but people black, black black students that really believe that universities can change the world. I don't know if if I live in a different world, but in the world I live, black people they do not want to go to university because they have better things to do. They do not want to discuss Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown and all of them. I'm not saying they're not good; they're very good. I studied all of them, but how we are going to talk with them, how we are going, how can we uh, decide to, we do not want to fail, we want to bring people to the university, and that's true, they are not coming, they don't want to go, they don't want to come, because they know that they are not going to have success, they are not going, they are going to wait for other people to be a full professor, to finish Thing. I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not very optimist, but I'm very worried about the world we are. And it's not just a problem to have a conservative president. The problem is with us, no? because we want to perpetuate this kind of structure. So how can we, be, how can, can we start to be different? No? Thank mm -hmm. you, all of Thank you, uh, Lilia. I, I was thinking of a comment by, uh, uh, by Miguel Valdez. Almeida here from Portugal that when he says that well he as a white ally of black movement his purpose is to talk to the white majority and explain that 
you know, uh, white fragility and privilege are all about and how things must change. But actually, my question here before was, how do we mix this? How do intertwine you being a citizen, a white citizen, ally of black movements, and still be an anthropology with more duties, moral duties, ethical duties, as far as your you know, your position uh, with students, with black students, et cetera, goes. And I, of course, that's even more relevant in Brazil and, and in the US, but it's relevant, for instance, in Italy and Portugal, and I'm sure in Poland as well. Um, although there are fewer black, black people, of course, but it, the, the problem is there, right? And, and I think that it's, it's something that is probably complicated uh, and that probably not for Imma, who's been in this line of thought and action for a long time, but for others that are apprentices still in this way of not only thinking but acting, since what we're talking about here now is real acting, right? I would May like to just say something about that. I think that. AAA has to have a strong statement uh, that challenges the president's belief that anti teaching anti-racism or doing anti-racism training is un-American. I think that's something that can be done. And then I think we need to do a real sort of in-house analysis of our departments and look at hiring to do a study and, and make it public that says we're not doing well. Uh, and, and what can we do, uh, whether those are institutes in which we are providing resources for those black anthropologists and others who want to be part, to have chairs come in and talk to them, one, to have chairs rotate so they're not in the same damn position for like 13 years or so, so that there's like this log jam and there's no new ideas and things because they control a lot. So I think those are, those are some concrete terms you know, that some concrete things that we can do because truly suffering, they really are suffering. I see a lot of people in pain. I know anthropologists who have left the field and the academy complete because the process of getting to was so traumatic. And yet we also know of white anthropologists who've done enough who are then swept through the, the process. And so there are those kinds of inequities that still are persisting today. Uh, I would like to add something from Italy, which is a small country, and from my experience. So um, one of the problems that I have is that I try, I, I teach a class about the history of anthropology. So, and I try just to decolonize um, and talk about black anthropologists, uh, women anthropologists, in our uh, history books, we just have two women anthropologists, which are, of course, Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict. But one problem is that all the books and articles that the students can read are, in, not, are not in Italian. So uh, this is my specific problem, but uh, uh, of course I try to um, uh, write a, a bibliography and, in different languages, somebody maybe can read French, Spanish, English, but I think it's very important in classes just to bring the problem, uh, to, to try to, uh, to, to be aware of the fact that not everybody comes from the same situation and that being white is something that is not neutral. And so try to talk about this in Italy we didn't even have a word to talk about whiteness. So it's really an effort and it's really difficult to, to develop an ambient where we can talk about this. Things are changing, things, things are moving. Uh, um, I feel hope, but uh, uh, one problem that we have in a small country like Italy is also that all the system is racist. So we. I want to translate just books that are written by white uh, anthropologists, male anthropologists, Western anthropologists, and this is a problem. Uh, and that I want the, my students to be aware. Hmm? I want them to be aware that the way they choose the object of their the, the research is not neutral at all. What they are doing, they are feeling what is trendy, what it can, it can help us to get inside the university, but this is a way of reproducing 
a lot of uh, structural inequalities, not just racism, but also sexism and other forms of inequalities that are specific also of my country and will change maybe in France or in Poland, I don't know. So uh, I also want them to be aware of what it means to, to choose an object of study. And uh, I really like very much what Joyce said at the beginning, that we are anthropologists, many anthropologists keep thinking that to be anthropologists is to, to study the other. Which is, who is the other? And if you study uh, middle class and white people, you are doing sociology. So I think that we still need to make a lot of discussion and open spaces like this one, uh, each one in our community, in our classes, in our university. And of course, I put myself in the position that I have to learn a lot. Uh, but I think it is important if we don't have a book that are translated that people can read, we need to talk and remember that there are other histories, you know, the ways of doing anthropology, are the anthropologists that you will not find in your book. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria. I, I was just thinking that we hear, you know, Virginia Dominguez wrote in the chat or somebody wrote that we should move away from the US only and look at the whole world. It's true because, well, if you think of Africa, a continent with, you know, hundreds of countries uh, and the fact that, uh, how many, how many African anthropologists do we actually know? Do we give our students to read? How many? And, and the second thing is the fact that most African anthropologists that, ha that get to be known, or scholars, not only anthropologists, that get to be known are actually African scholars who go to the US or the UK to study. Otherwise, if they remain in their countries in Africa, they don't get to be known. They don't get to be translated. They don't get to be read. And this is, I think, tied into another problem which we all have and that we are exercising here today, which is the hegemony of English language. And, and that's a problem we all anthropologists face. And I think it's also, in my opinion, tied to somehow racism in the sense that nowadays we live in a world where, you know, the, only the high ranking uh, journals are give you points to go up in the career and they're all published in English. So what happens to all our native languages all over Europe, all over Africa. They don't exist. It's like they don't exist. And I think that's a problem, which we have tackled in a, in a sense, but then it kind of was moved away. For me, of course, this would be another topic for another webinar and in WCA and while we also have been trying to handle this problem with publications in different languages, but it's a problem and it's, it gets worse once you move to Africa and to African scholars and to African students and to, you know where they do not have the opportunity to, to have their papers and their thoughts even read worldwide. I will speak in Portuguese. It would be great, you know. And that's true, you know. We have different kind of imperialism, you know. Language is a very serious imperialism. You know? uh, Irma asked if we have Brazilians, black anthropologists, women. Yes, we have, but they are just in Portuguese. So, that's a problem. That's a problem for a country that speaks Portuguese. That's, it's not a language, a universal language as we call. It's yeah. really a thing that the AAA can engage in is a translation project so that we can get the voices of Blacks from other countries out there. That would be worth a grant. That might be something that we can get someone in so that we then have a resource database and can be able to read their articles and give feedback and comment. Um, you know, so that, I think that's, that's the other part of it is too. Yeah, good idea. That, that's a great idea, Irma, that like I said, WCA has been doing the In Sus Propios Terminals, which is trying to publish in Spanish, Japanese, et cetera. But yes, the, the work that AAA is doing on that would be great if they could add that asset to it. It would be really good.